All right, Feel Good Fathers, getting sleep right for a baby is the biggest single unlock to their early development. And happy parents. My guest today is Jamie Gull. Uh, why don't you tell us about what that means and a little bit about yourself? Yeah, hi, Jay. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Jamie. Uh, I'm an aerospace engineer, former SpaceX engineer, and then founder of uh, two aerospace companies and sailor, and now new parent of an 18 month old baby boy. Um, yeah. And what does that mean? I mean, going into parenthood, there were two things that really concerned me. One is like a more general making him a happy, healthy, productive member of society. But one was like, how do you get through that first early period of your life? Uh, and after looking at it more, sleep to me became the clear factor that makes that first year better. Like, uh, there's been a lot of sleep studies recently focused on adults and the world's sleep habits, especially in the US, are particularly bad now. Wow, with screens is a is a huge factor, social media, blue light, et cetera. And it just shows how bad your health gets and how bad it is for brain uh, healing and development. And it's pretty easy to look at that and say, okay, the same thing's happening with the baby. They're just not doing studies on it to that extent. And the baby's brain is learning constantly. Obviously, it's just inundated with new new experiences and data every day. And sleep is where that all gets consolidated. Movement gets consolidated. So if you don't have good sleep for the baby, it's not going to be learning as quickly. Um, it's not going to be as happy. So it's going to be much grumpier. And then you know, for a parent, like it's a it's a trying time, right? You're you're sleep deprived. You've got this little crying potato uh, that's got all these needs, and you don't know what they are. And if you're exhausted, it just makes it so much harder. And so getting that sleep right is also aimed at you, like making you happy and letting you best serve your baby and your partner, um, and lets you live the rest of your life that's not a parent without being the zombie and there's this stereotypical image of a new parent with the huge bags under the eyes and just floating through their day-to-day -day life uh, i don't think you have to do that so that's that was uh why we focused on that i think i think this is such a fantastic perspective for new fathers and um part of the feel good fatherhood movement part of this whole community is this idea that there are these stereotypes there are these messages and i and i think a lot of uh birth rates are kind of down but there's there's some other that's not really what's important in this discussion but i hear a lot of younger couples say well i don't want to have kids because i don't want to sacrifice my sleep or it's going to ruin my productivity because they're maybe they're more career focused or something like that and i think of these kind of discussions where you know i i read your book uh, one sleep baby you know, scan through it, kind of gone through it. I've had great sleep experiences with both of my children. Uh, my youngest now being eight months, heading on nine months old. We we're working on dialing in that sleep schedule, that sleep through. We have like one or two interruptions in the in the evening, like sorry at night. And she's on the you know as you suggest that twelve hour cycle. It's good to dispel these myths and to say like, hey, your baby's going to do this, your baby's going to do that, and in the same way. Uh, parts of the personality, I think, are static. You're kind of alluding to this, like parts of your parts of your child's personality are, are born into them. They anybody that has kids understands that every kid is unique, and they all have their own little little elements that they kind of show you and teach you about their personality. But the 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 habits that we know create healthiness; those are things that it's responsibility of the parent to educate themselves on and instill the routines and habits. Kids love routines and habits. They thrive on them. Uh, one of my favorite practices is that I think it was when my daughter was about four or five years old, I set an alarm every day at a certain time that goes off and she has almost like a Pavlovian response where she knows, ah, now it's wind down time. <laughs> you know, So now it's quiet time. We're putting everything away. We're we're resting, maybe we're finishing up a show, but it's the alarm goes off, she hears it, she knows, okay, sleep is around the corner. It has bit off and, and headed off all these arguments about bedtime that are typical for a young adult for a, a toddler into a 
don't even know what you would call it a kid. <laughs> what was that like from the from the four to eight year old just completely headed off at the pass because we trained her like, hey, this alarm goes off, it's time for bed. Um, okay, that's enough about me. Let's go right into <laughs> <laughs> let's go into sort of um, your experiences. Uh, we've alluded to this book. There'll be a link down in the bio. Tell us about why it is that you wrote this book, kind of the research that went into it, and then we'll kind of step through the contents. Sure. Uh, before that, like you, you mentioned younger parents say not doing it, you know, we're a little bit older, we're forties, early forties. And we've had younger friends though, look at us as we bring our babies out on the boat, we bring them to parties, et cetera, and can put him down in random places, um, to have a nap. And so our lives are less affected and they're like, oh, like maybe we'll have a kid sooner. Like you can do this. Um, and still have a life. And looking back at our parents, they both do that all the time, both me and my wife. And so you, your night, your life's night over, um, especially if you can nail the sleep, right? So you're, you're so what, adding, what can... you're, you're adding a bundle of joy and love. Like you're adding, exactly. Uh, you might be exchanging young person concerns for a fullness and a purpose that just doesn't exist pre the baby. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Yeah, so our our process for for this, um, you know, I'm an aerospace engineer. My wife has a PhD in computational genomics, which is just DNA analysis, fancy words for DNA analysis. Uh, so we're both pretty good at doing research, distilling it, and and working with numbers. Uh, so go and we're, we overanalyze things. So I'll just admit that right out there. Um, and going in, we, we read a bunch of books. We're both avid readers outside of parenting also, and started taking notes and compiling them in different viewpoints so that we would have a plan when we walked in. And so by the time we were at seven, eight months pregnancy, we pretty much had a plan written down for how we were going to attack sleep and feeding. And we did that and we got to the point where our baby boy was sleeping very well. And we were taking him places like to friends' houses and like, oh, I have to put him down for his nap. And I'd go in and put him down for his nap. And like three minutes later, I'd be back out at the party. And our friends were like, well, what just happened? Um, and uh, they had kids and their kids are, you know, five, six, seven, eight now. Um, a bunch of people there were like, we never were able to do that. And we realized that like through that, process we had developed these habits and we had things in certain ways a lot easier than from our other friends we got these comments quite often um and we're like well maybe we should write it down like we we already have it uh basically planned out in other you know google excel docs and stuff like that if people are really interested in this why don't we write it down and so we we compiled our thoughts into this you know it's a concise pdf i can't remember it's only like 20 pages or something. So it's yep. very tactical advice. Um, it's, it's no BS. Cause we read a lot of books that were 200 pages long and then ended up going back to each chapter, skimming read through and coming out with like the three takeaways from that chapter. Um, and doing a lot of backtracking, back, backtracking on like, at what month do you feed this much and sleep at this time? Um, and it was very confusing. So these books were really helpful, um, getting across the concepts, but the details and how do you implement that was really hard. And, you know, a lot of them contradicted themselves a little bit, both internally in one book and between books. So it was this game of how do you meld the data and come up with what works for you. And so we had all that and we figured if we could put that together in something that somebody could read in half an hour. And then go back to as a reference where it's all written out and like very accessible bullet points um, that it would just be helpful and you're you know you're busy and tired as a parent so going having that quick access to that information that would be would be nice awesome so what's the um you know what would you say would be sort of the the core foundational ideas that that uh, a, a new parent should pay attention to with regards to their baby sleep eating habits, that, that kind of jazz. Yeah, on a like 
more generic level that to approach this, you know, the things that we looked at were, and this one of them comes from directly from a book. I can't remember which one, but start how you want to finish or end up. So if you want to have a one or two year old baby with a very brief bed routine, um, and then they just go to sleep on their own, you know, you can start that process at one month old. It's a little different, but like you can have that in mind where we, we do know people who have 45 minute, one hour long bedtime routines. And to me, the idea of doing that on a nightly basis is just like terrifying. Like, like okay, it's six o'clock. I have to spend the next hour getting them ready for bed. Um, that just, I mean, I know it works, but that just seems like a huge waste of everybody's time. Um, so that's like, where do you want to end up? Start as close to that as you can based on their age. Um, and build think, back from I'd like to I'd like to add here that a conception that people could res, could respond to here would be, oh, you don't want to spend time with your kids. Uh, the thought I just had was with our first child, I would read to her at night. And then what I realized is it created the pattern of, oh, I've got to read to her every single night. And so um what we ended up doing to work on that was number one, allow for as much reading as she wanted at night. You know, she's a bit older now, so she can kind of self-regulate. And sometimes when it's a bit too late, you know, I might pop my head in and be like, it's super late. <laughs> you're up pretty, you know, you're up pretty late. Time to wind down your drawing or time to wind down your reading. And we've done that piece. But it's it's created a different kind of shift. What it moves is those moments that you would typically interact with or do at night become what you would do during the day. So if I was reading a book, like what I'm doing with my youngest now is I'm reading to her during the day at any given time. And that's creating that situation because I know she's going to follow our eldest and our eldest has her own sort of wind down routine and things that she does at night to kind of soothe herself, so to speak. So I don't think it's an aspect of, I didn't want to engage in this perspective. I think the perspective is, my intention is to run my house in this way. These are the habits and routines that I want. And as a parent, you said, I don't want to be a slave to that particular routine. Instead, we're going to instill something different. Yeah, absolutely. And it's not like that. Well, let's just call it an hour bedtime routine. It's not like now we don't spend that time with them. It's just, I didn't want to be beholden to that. So that if we're out somewhere, it doesn't happen. Or we can spend the time going to the park, playing uh, in the summer evenings, or we can read, or we can play with all the toys here, but we're not, it's not like, okay, now we're beholden to this schedule um, to get them ready for bed, what, whatever that may be. Um, so yeah, it's not a, it's not a, like, I don't want to spend time with them. It's just a different use and it's a more flexible use of that time. 100%. Love it. So begin with in mind, what, what's the next idea? Yeah, so next um, would say that really, and, and just right back into the habits, schedule consistency, feeding, getting those kind of locked in as early as possible um, really will create the best success. And, and hand in hand with that is that the, the concept that we read about this is, creating a bad habit takes about three days and seven days to break it. So if all of a sudden your baby requires something after three days um, to go to sleep, it's going to take you seven days of pain um, where you're having to remove that portion um, before they can get along without it. And so it's both uh, helpful and hopeful, but also scary because it's like, it's so easy to create this bad habit. Mm -hmm. However, it's not like it's unbreakable. It's just more work, right? It's more than two times the work. And who knows if those numbers are right, but I think the concept is correct where it's much easier to cave to something that works in the moment. And then, but then four days later, you might've locked that in at least until you can go break that habit. So. I, th I, think a, that's a, the, I think that's the danger, right? That you were, it sounds like you were avoiding was this whole idea that you don't want to be, be beholden to the whims and desires 
of the little creature, <laughs> your little, your little feel good kids. And uh, I think um, that uh, that is mind boggling. Those numbers. That's just it's just crazy. You know, it's like you're you're exactly as you're describing. Just the um, there's a handful of jokes in in your book that that I won't I won't spoil, but um, it's spot on. Okay, what's the next idea? Yeah, and I mean, there's all this research around adults too, right? And I think the numbers are worse. It's like once you're an adult, 30 days of consistently building a good new habit is what it requires, or something like that. So, luckily, babies are a little more flexible, but the, I think the research luckily, stands. Yeah, physically and mentally, right? <laughs> yes, yes, very much physically. Um, some other things, you know. One thing was that you can, you've already heard me talk about is like the babies joining your life. We didn't want to become the parents that our entire schedule is built around the baby. And this goes through childhood, right? So like a little bit older, like I don't want to spend my entire weekend going to a, a kid's museum, a baby birthday party, like one after the other, where it's all aimed at the kid. It's more for us, the philosophy was bring the kid along on your life you have fun together as a family doing the things that you love and you just have to adjust those activities, obviously. Right. Like you're not like we used to go canyoneering in whitewater. We're not taking our one-year-old baby down a canyon in whitewater, but we do a lot of sailing with them, which a lot of people look at and say, that's too hard, but we know a lot of other people who do it too. So that was an overarching philosophy that we tried to bring in um, and we'll try and continue and, you know, looking back at my childhood on the weekends, we were out backpacking, riding mountain bikes, going skiing, which is all stuff my parents were doing. And now they adjusted it to fit to us and everything became much, you know, shorter distances and all that. And you're not getting out there as far, but it's the same stuff. And you really get to bond as a family over those activities rather than, you know, standing Maybe this is like a bad image of us standing on the side of a birthday party with the other parents talking about work while your kids play or, you know, doing everything around the kid. Um, and I think it's a good lesson for the child, too, that like not everything's about me, right? This is like we do this together. Um, and so I think that goes hand in hand. What a, I think what a good lesson to, you know, if we're talking about society a little bit. Uh, as the access to information and personalization and customization is as quick and easy as opening your phone, which makes every in every person's experience a little bit of an island. So they have a little bit. There's there's far fewer shared experiences today. I guess they're kind of morphing. So rather than you know, going to the local like for me, growing up in Toronto was going to Canada's Wonderland. Uh, I think it's I forget what it's called now, but it got bought by one of the major, it's like Paramount, Paramount Canada's Wonderland or something like that. And so that was a shared experience in Toronto. Nowadays, we're kind of like, oh, did you see what happened on Snapchat? And with the increase in software that's being released out there and an increase in different tools, uh, it's now getting to the point where like one grade band is having an experience, like a shared experience within one grade. And so there's far fewer shared experiences because everything's going customization. It's mm. good to have at that age instill this idea that you are a part of a collective. So there's there's some um there's some research about uh identity and how your parents are really one of the big things that they're responsible for very early is the separation of is the you have an identity as how you interact with the collective and less that there's an amalgamation of of the two and part of that training is teaching them that you are a participant in our life right that you participate in the household that you have an identity in the house this is that whole concept as they get older that you give them progressively more and more chores progressively more and more responsibility they're they're yes. building an identity of how they interact with the group um that is a in, that is a great perspective Feel good fathers, feel good parents everywhere should be listening to that to incorporate your kids into what you like to do with adjustments. Yeah, exactly. One of the books we read that really talked a lot about that was Hunt Gather Parent. 
and it it really focuses on you know indigenous tribes and peoples and how they work with kids as more as a jumping off point to that but they really talk about how kids want to be involved with chores and household stuff because they're part of the unit and a lot of people will give them fake stuff to do and the kids you know even at a really young age they're not that dumb you know they know that you're giving them something not real and giving them you know within safety confines obviously like you're not going to hand a child a, a butcher's knife to, say cut up the meat until they're old enough but you know you can give them real stuff and like we found i mean our guy at probably like 15, 14 16 months he started helping us unload the dishwasher unprompted he just wanted to be part of what was going on so when we were doing it mm -hmm. he starts handing up plates which was completely surprising we didn't even encourage it like it's it was very obvious to us that that was real and they want to be a part of it uh, part of your activities as much as they can. So it's pretty, pretty cool to see. Uh, feel good fathers, just click the rewind and listen to that whole thing again. <laughs> just, that was a great moment, a uh, great moment for, for the for feel good fathers out there. Uh, there's, awesome. a, there's a couple of things I'd like to add in here. There's a huge swath of this, of these ideas are around feeding and sleeping. And I'd love for you to kind of give us an overview or a summary of uh, sort of what your learnings were uh, kind of in because because now we're kind of getting to the point where especially when it comes to the feeding and sleeping we're partially helping baby but we're really really helping mom if you're doing the traditional uh breastfeeding thing and so walk walk us through a little bit of what your learnings were here yeah this is a pretty touchy subject so i'll just preface it with we're not experts we're not doctors um, and that's another thing we wrote about is like, everybody's got an opinion and, you know, you could throw an expletive in there, um, about them and everybody will judge each other. And like, you just got to figure out what works best for you. And I mean, that totally goes for some of the things that I've said about long bedtime routines. That's just my opinion, right? Like if that's what you want to do and that's what you want to establish, then you should just go do that. Um, around feeding, you know, we, we had. Uh, a mixed feeding schedule, some breast milk, some formula, which was driven by both personal choices and necessity. Uh, and we found it was actually really awesome because there is some good research that shows uh, that breast milk is beneficial in the first year of life for, for brain development, right? Like it's, you can get away with formula if you need to, for sure. Like you shouldn't feel guilty about that. But if you can, the research does show that breast milk helps. Um, and so having some of that, we, we thought was great. But having some formula too for us was awesome because it meant that I could get up at 4 a.m. and take care of the feeding and change the diaper while my wife slept. And instead of getting, you know, three hours of sleep straight, she got six, right? And you can do that a couple times and all of a sudden you're, you're sharing the burden together compared to, you know, but pre-formula days when that literally wasn't possible. Um, and the other thing that what, goes hand in hand with that, go ahead. What I love about that particular element is that we do some research here at Feel Good Fatherhood on the neuroscience of this. So what's happening is that in these activities, when you're helping, especially your wife, your partner, you're releasing vasopressin, which for men, for the Feel Good Father, is a far more bonding neurochemical than oxytocin. We have, we as men have more vasopressin receptors than we do oxytocin. For, for mom, she has more oxytocin, different, different mm -hmm. bonding style. Uh, but vasopressin is released by overcoming things together, by solving a problem for, which is why there's that stereotype where he wants to just solve the problem, he wants to fix. It's actually, uh, for the moms listening, it's he's actually saying, I want to bond more to you, or it's I care for you, I want to bond more to you. So it's not that he thinks that he knows better, it's just that that's his brain saying, Oh, I like you, I want to bond more to you. And so take that as a right. take that as you will. Um, and I'm I sure there's people that agree and disagree. That's pretty, that's pretty cool. Um, I didn't know that it does, um, I guess explain some stereotypes, uh, yeah, for sure. There's always a reason. It's hormones, like you learn in this process and we learn in other processes. Hormones are real. Like they 
have extreme effects on your emotions and well-being. So uh, playing into that is definitely smart. Yeah, yeah. So uh, midnight feedings, helping out, helping you know, uh, help helping mom get a better sleep schedule. Uh, you're able to, to participate in some of the the nurture and the caring of baby. Uh, what else? Yeah, I mean, one thing that we focused on was getting them to have a lot of milk in one sitting, in one compressed period of time, um, because then you're, you know, early on. So I've already forgotten the exact hours and schedules, but like, I believe early on, like we got them up to, you know, three hours in between feedings almost immediately. And it's every 90 uh, minutes to three hours or something like that. Um, and if you're doing it every 90 minutes and it takes 45 minutes, well, like, okay, so you are literally feeding 50% of their time and the rest of their sleep. That's brutal um, for everybody involved, right? So, you know, I don't have any good tips on how to get the baby to drink more. I think we kind of lucked out on that, but not, you know, giving up and I like immediately and, and doing um, feed on demand, you know, more of a schedule, I think really helped us. Um, but that's also kind of controversial. So, you know, do your own I've research had, and make a decision. I've had, I've had crazy parents, not, not crazy parents. I've had crazy stories from parents where I've heard as the, you know, as the child is four, not being able to sleep unless they're breastfed, just like, unless they're nursing in some capacity and just like, whoa, like this is like, this is yeah. crazy. You know, it's that's just a really long. I mean, I've heard, you know, uh, our first experience was was very similar to this was that we had that very very condensed schedule of awake time and feed time uh and we just didn't have the we didn't have the wherewithal to understand what was going on so we were on formula very quick to your previous point about formula and breast milk and, and that kind of stuff um yeah it makes so, sense yeah yeah i think then the formula can help enable a bigger feeding right because often it's just it's more available, right? And so the baby doesn't have to work as hard for it. Um, so it does have that benefit uh, if you choose to supplement. Awesome. Yeah, and then, I'm, I mean, I think that's like one key linchpin because babies like to sleep after they eat, right? So getting them well fed is a, is a key step to getting them to sleep well and sleep longer before they wake up hungry again. Um, and that, that I think is also incredibly important as you're trying to extend their sleep through the night. Um, if they're not well fed, they're not going to sleep that long. It's just like they burn through those calories so fast. Um, and then they're going to be hungry again. But if you can get them to load up, um, they're, they're going to start sleeping longer just automatically. Like you won't have to do anything. Um, and so, so if you're doing, you know, feeding on demand with little, you know, a couple ounces here, a couple ounces there. That's what you're going to do all night. Um, and you, you got to mm. get away from that, in my opinion. Uh, I don't, you know, know, again, how you specifically do that outside of training formula um, because it's more available. But I have heard and, you know, didn't have to try this, but like if you withhold it some and it's painful, right, because your baby's going to be crying. But don't, you know, don't give in right away. Let them draw it out. Then they'll be hungrier. Then they'll take more then they can go longer. Um, but I don't speak from experience there. Got it. You, you brought up that we're, we're getting all these habits together because we have an end in mind. So what was the desired result that you wanted to create? Yeah, we wanted him to be sleeping through the night by four months old. Um, and we got real close to that. Uh, and, you know, everybody's definition through the night is a little bit different. I think for us, it was like eight straight hours by four months and then another four hours um, was where we got to. And for us, that was essentially a full night's sleep as an adult, right? Um, so that was like, that was the goal. Um, and then not too long thereafter, he's just doing 12 hours straight every night um, and has been since probably five or six months old. I don't remember exactly. Um, That's what I was so yeah and you know you mentioned earlier every baby's different personality if you're like if you have colic or some other medical thing like none of this really applies you just got to figure out how to best deal with that and like i'm sorry 
Um, so not, not everything works, but like it's and some of that's just luck of the draw, just like personality, right? As far as, as that goes. When you were, uh, so we know that the, the whole idea was so that mom and dad could have the full night's sleep and that we were kind of modeling, I guess what you would kind of consider close to standard behavior. I'm really curious about the, the day, like not daycare, but your daycare. Is it, is mommy home? Is, is, is it a daycare situation? Do you have a nanny? Like what's the, what's the situation during the day? Yeah. Mom took four months of uh, maternity leave. Um, and so was, was there during the day and, you know, exact same thing goes for the day. You set that schedule and you just stick to it and we got him. It, it's actually pretty wild. It's like the body has a clock in it once you establish it. Um, and so he said she was home until four months and then straight to daycare. Um, and it's, a um, in-home daycare, multi-age. So anywhere from three months up to two and a half years. So it's kind of cool because the kids are with different age kids. Um, and they get to see the older kids and model that. Yeah. And she basically followed our, um, rough sleep schedule, uh, immediately thereafter. And so as we adapted that, um, we would just let her know, okay, he's doing this now. Um, that was the part I was really curious about was how, how, when you're bringing in third party, third party guardians, what was like, how was, how did it maintain, like, what were the challenges that you saw with maintaining the sleep schedule? It, it sounds like with, yeah. in your experience, it was good. Yeah, it mostly was, but there was definitely times when it was like obvious and it still happens now on the weekends, he'll take like a two and a half, three hour nap. He's down to one nap. But I know he doesn't do that at daycare, right? I think he's making up for a little bit of lost time. Like he's so excited mm. to go play with the kids. The other kids are waking up. Like he's not going to stay asleep, right? Um, there's little things like that, but it was pretty good. And uh, you know, most daycares that I've seen, like if you literally write out the times for them, they'll try and adhere to them as best as possible. We were more flexible than that, but they'll they'll try. So if you really want to lock it in, I think you can do it. Got it. Maybe. Got it. <laughs> yeah, I think there's a there's the the thing to say here is you really want to have partners that are going to support your habits, and this goes for in laws, your parents, daycares, any sort of childcare. Right. You know, to me, it's a huge red flag and part of the boundary of being the parent of saying this these are the habits of this house, these are the habits we're instilling. We want you to support our routines and finding partners in that. Uh, whether that be family or or third party care, um, well, that's that's great. So, I mean, you're at eight, 18 months. Any reflections on anything? Anything to impart to feel good fathers as they're kind of moving through uh, th these processes? Yeah, I mean, like I said, looking back, like I don't even remember a lot of the timing schedules. We joked that uh, when we had our parents over, they're like, "Wait, we have to feed them every." remember two and a half hours at that point and changes diaper like all these times and wait, you guys did this like how do you not remember this but like 18 months later i don't remember it so i'm like oh okay i get it everything changes and then like you, you just kind of let it go so um i would say for any of that like you know look at our book and that's what we did and that's a better source of truth um after you know after that really our focus shifted like we got those good sleep habits um in place and you know we put them down for a nap or bedtime it's still five minutes like every time um it's you know change change him brush his teeth now which is hilarious uh <laughs> say good night and put him down and he just like literally by the time we've changed him and we're walking towards the crib, he's got his thumb in his mouth, his head on our shoulders. And he's, he's like, all right, I'm sleeping. Um, we might hear some babbles, but that's about it. Um, so once we got, I was gonna say, we've done a lot of the same. We, uh, for, for this time, we, uh, mom initiated this effort, like a similar effort to what you, you wrote down and we've now got her, um, our youngest. It's like, here, like pick her up and she she recognizes the hallway as we're walking towards the she's eight months so where she's she knows the hallway and then just 
the feeling is she's I, I always feel like she's like absorbing herself into my arm. So like she's getting heavier, even though she's the same weight. That's kind of the, the phenomenon that I notice. And then by the time uh, you know, we have a sleep sack, so by the time we get her in the sleep sack and then into the crib, she's ready. <laughs> no more fussing, no yeah, more. So. Um, some, I mean, it's a great feeling. You're like, all right, cool. Yeah. Yeah, especially at night. Awesome. Well, Jamie, if folks want to learn more about this and learn more about you, how can they reach out? You know, where should they go? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, the the book is One Sleepy Baby, onesleepybaby.com, all one word. Um, like I said, it's like a short guide, uh, very tactical. Um, and I just lowered the price on it. So that's good. Uh, we haven't really been advertising it yet. We kind of did it as a a passion project. Um, but I'm going to try and start pushing a little bit more out there in the world to see if we can get some more folks reading it and hopefully help out some more people. And, um, other than that, like, uh, you know, I'm on LinkedIn a lot because I'm, you know, founder of two companies. Um, so LinkedIn is profile is, uh, Jamie dash gull. So J A M I E dash G U L L um, on Twitter at Jamie gull, just one word. Not super active on Twitter. I did put a tweet out about this this morning about about One Sleepy Baby, and I'll throw out a tweet once this gets published. Um, I'm trying to get more active on Twitter. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Jamie Gull, everybody. Thanks. Hey, guys, if you enjoyed this conversation, please subscribe to Feel Good Fatherhood, where you can learn a lot more. Thanks. Awesome. And that was, that was a fantastic combo of, oh, and guess what? Right here? Yes. Right here above me? This is the next video. YouTube has decided that this video is the one that you should watch. Hopefully it's one of mine. Click the button, it's right here.